Hey United people of the world and welcome to another sugar-coated mega crispy experience we call the tube and that's what's on tonight. Israeli filmmaker presents controversial web series, tablet app translates sign language to text and speech, the web myth of Slenderman, YouTube channel Rooster Teeth raises $1 million, the social watch and more but let's start with our favorite spy. With the one-year asylum period granted by the Kremlin to the world's number one whistleblower running out on August 1st, and with tensions between the US and Russia at their highest since the Cold War, Edward Snowden is increasingly thrust to into this geopolitical conflict. Now, Boris Karpchen Karp Chikov, an ex kgb spy who defected to Britain in the late 1990s, alleges in an interview with the British tabloid Sunday People that the Russian secret services began monitoring Snowden as early as 2007 and have marked him as ripe for defection. Bondastic. This tidbit of information comes days after Snowden himself said in his NBC interview that he worked for the CIA and was trained as a spy, making him far deeper involved with the great game than he previously claimed. If Karpchikov spilling is Karpchikov spilling the fine beans of truth in honest gravy, or could he be pushing some greater agenda, one that seeks to sully Snowden in the eyes of those who consider him a hero? And what will our fearless hero of modern web anarchism do in the next installment of The Hacker Who Loved Me? Well, this is what John Kerry thinks he's ought to do. The bottom line is, this is a man who has betrayed his country, who is sitting in Russia, an authoritarian country, uh, where he has taken refuge. Uh, it, you know, he should man up and come back to the United States if he has a complaint about what's the matter with American uh, surveillance. Come back here and stand uh, in our system of justice uh, and, and, and make his case. Nah, Mr. Kerry, we don't see that happening. We just don't. Now, in ancient times, back in 1990s, people actually believed that the web will make the world a better place. Now we can all ridicule such utopian fantasies and laugh and laugh, but there's nothing funny about it. Some people have not despaired yet. One of those people is Noah Maiman, a well-known Israeli actress and filmmaker residing in LA, who decided to take her own tragic experience as a rape victim and unleash it onto, a web, onto the web to help others. Toolkit for the Rape Victim is one of the bravest web series we've seen here on the tube. It consists of just Maimon talking to her camera and her viewers at home in a radically minimalist style. And it is heart crushing. Let's take a quick look before we go on. It's not only about the society making us silent, it's also about us. We know how difficult it is to contain. Hence, we're not as likely to share it with other people. So on one hand, we really want their love and their support, but we know what it makes them feel when we talk about it, so we try to not talk about that, and in turn we remain really lonely. So speaking about it, it's really important, but it can be challenging. My personal rape angel, she allowed me to share it, obviously. She was in a religious school, and when she was raped, she told a friend from school, the friend told the manager. The manager said that because the rape took place in the city, it means she didn't scream. Because she didn't scream, she's a whore, and it's her fault. And not only she was thrown away from school, all her classmates were told to ban her because she's a prostitute and she's promiscuous. Promiscuous is a word. With us in the studio to discuss this brave and explosive web series is Noah Maiman herself. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing this remarkable web creation. Thank you for having me. So, Noah, you're quite well known in Israeli uh, TV industry circles as an actress, as in a TV documentary filmmaker. Why not use your contacts to make a proper documentary film? Why a web series? Well, I knew for a while that I want to make a film about that. All my documentaries always been about topics that I really care deeply for, and, and that's definitely one of them. But then I found myself with the dilemma, do I make another documentary that collects testimonies from all over the world of 
how bad we're treated as women. And I figured I want to do something a bit more useful. I wanted to, I wanted it to be a tool for the actual victims or the survivors of sexual abuse and rape, rather than another kind of showing how much do we suffer. And and I was I was playing with the idea of making a documentary about that for a while, but I was trying to find a way to kind of crack it in a different way, to crack it in a way that would be useful for the actual survivors. And I figured that would demand something else. And then came the idea of web series. A good friend told me that he believes that the future is in the internet. And I started seeing some web series done about these topics and others. And I figured, you know what, with that I could actually reach as many people, you know, I could reach more people that I will reach in TV or series, mm -hmm. no matter where it's going to be aired. And and it's always there, you know. So whenever someone finds himself or finds herself dealing with, with uh, flashbacks, with the memories kind of attacking her again, it's always there. Um, so it doesn't have, like... The accessibility was very important for you. Yes, very much. And also there was part of the idea was to create a, situ uh, a sensation that it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Mm -hmm. So for that for that to occur, I figured TV or cinema is not the right place. I wanted everyone who watches that to watch it on their own computer, feeling like we're having a personal conversation. You know, um, you have a certain uh, degree of um, um, celebrity status when you here in Israel, uh, but you're always a really private person. Um, isn't this kind of an extreme exposure for you? Um, it's definitely an exposure. Uh, I feel very much in control because I shot it and I wrote it and I'm editing that. So I don't give, you know, I don't give anyone else control of, on what I want to say and how I'm going to say that. So in that sense, I did keep my control. But it is a very personal topic. When I was thinking about it, I was, I was thinking for a second maybe to do something scripted, maybe to be, bring an actress. But to be honest, I think that the strength of, of the project is it's an authenticity, and in that sense, the only person that can talk about his own experience, in my case, was me. So, um, so you did it. You know, people in Israel were quite shocked by the idea of um, a toolkit for the rape victim. Do you understand this reaction? Can you explain it? Yeah, and, and funnily enough, I did decide that in the middle of the season to change the name. So initially it was toolkit for the fresh rape victim, and the idea behind that was that the average rape victim only start talking about that in an average of 5 to 15 years after the effect, if not longer. So, you know, the fresh was in mm -hmm. brackets, but there were, I heard from a couple of people, including someone that was raped, that because of the name she doesn't want to watch it. I would say it was a minority, like the majority, even girls that cannot even say the word rape because it's so hard for them, they watched that. So the majority were kind of okay with that, but I did decide uh, towards the middle of the season that it's kind of time to go from this a bit, uh, I would not say aggressive, but kind of in your face title to a mm -hmm. bit more optimistic still in your title. Face, though. Uh, toolkit for rape recovery, it is kind of still in your face, mm -hmm. but I think it, it puts its focus on, on recovery and kind of an optimistic way out of that rather than maintaining the victimization in a way. Do you think uh, the web can actually help uh, a woman or a man or a person in this situation? Isn't that something that requires um, serious professional help? I'll start by saying, and I did say there, I'm not a professional. I'm just a person that went through sexual abuse and rape and share the, what I discovered in my path of, of, of recovery. And for sure, this is not a, it's not a replacement for therapy. And in the end of every episode, I, I give the numbers of the hotlines. And th there, is, there should definitely be discussion with someone professional that, that knows how to deal with that matter. Um, but I do think that it has a lot of value. I think the problem, uh, I just came now from the hotline, the Israeli hotline, and they were talking about the fact that the idea of you're not alone has to two levels to that. One level is that you're not alone because we're here for you. But the other one is you're not alone. So many of us went through that. And I think that has a huge value. I think for someone who went through rape and, and she's dealing with the guilt, with the shame, with the feeling that she brought it on herself, all those things that are textbook symptoms, I think for her, the value of seeing someone else in front of her saying, yeah, you know, I went through that. And this and this is what I discovered as a way of recovering, I think it has a huge impact and a huge help for them. Sometimes in therapy, um, even you know, one of the girls that approached me after the series, she's been in therapy for 10 years and she's been dealing with that and she still cannot talk about it. And suddenly in the dialogue between her and me following the series, she said for the first time that she was raped. So, so I think 
with all due respect, and there is a huge respect to therapy, and that's that's the, the real source that people should approach, I think there is a great value in talking with someone like you that just went through the same experience. You did seven episodes. Are you planning to continue? Is there going to be a second um, season or more episodes? Uh, there will be. The first season will be 11 episodes, all mm -hmm. in all. So by now I have like 10 of them I already shoot, and the last one I'm waiting to shoot once just before it's going to be on air. But uh, I, I don't know. Initially, I thought of myself that after that I, I need some break from dealing with rape for a while but then I hear so many requests and stories from people so I'm playing with the idea I'm thinking possibly to do a second season that would be other people women and men talking about their experience but I'll see I'll see where is my mental my mental stability when I finish this season and, and see well, what I can do I don't know stay strong you're doing something super important and I personally think you are a hero so stay strong and thank you very much thank you very much thank you for having me <laughs> Yeah, okay, and on a kind of similar note, why don't you use all your tech skills for something good for a change? So, why don't you take example from the Motion Savvy team working to utilize the Leap Motion controller together with a tablet to harness its 3D motion recognition abilities into a sign language interpreter. Using the proposed Leap-based tablet, deaf and hearing impaired people will be able to talk to the controller in sign language, and this great little gadget it will translate the input into text or voice. But wait, there's more! This also will get voice input and translate it into text, making the conversation a two-sided effort, as a conversation should be, of course. Now, days after two 12-year-old girls from Wisconsin stabbed their classmate to near death, a teenage girl in Ohio stabbed her mother, causing her minor injuries. The unlikely connection between the two events, the internet myth of Slenderman. Slenderman is a horror character who originated on the Something Awful forums, quickly escalating into a full-blown myth written collectively by many users. Is it that different than claiming that a heavy metal album inspired a murder by clearly mentally disturbed teens? Probably not, but at least now conservative pundits will have something to warn parents about. Slenderman is now the subject of many fan-made movies and games. Here's one horrific example, so you can blame art too. Now that I can talk fluently, let me explain your position in this area. Where am I? Who do you want from me? This is where I take them. The souls of pure children. To live out the rest of their lives here. In happiness. Rather than the cursed lives that they would have had if they had stayed alive. This isn't what I want. I have friends. I have a family. You are choosing. And that, my friends, is bad acting. Let's move on. This clever little ad prank from Volkswagen is a demonstration of an idea you should all have gotten into your phone addicted heads a long time ago. Don't text and drive, dummies. That's how you do a campaign that was very good. Now, Sir Mix-a-Lot performed Baby Got Back with the Seattle Symphonic Orchestra. The video went viral because it's not only mind-blowingly awesome, it actually puts the ass in classical music. Yes, that's what I just said. What? I like big foot and I can't Yeah. 
That's lovely. We're all for um, collaborations. And that's it. This show is over. Thank you very much for watching our show. Uh, join us on our Twitter and our Tumblr. It's the Tube24, the Tube24. And always remember, it takes a big man to cry, but it takes a bigger man to laugh at that man. <laughs> goodbye, 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 goodbye.